Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar, The Increasing Financial Vulnerability of Canadian Households, host hosted by Prosper Canada. My name is Sasha McNichol, and I am the Policy Manager at Prosper Canada. So uh, just a few um, logistics before we begin. Um, please note that everyone in the audience has been put on mute. You can share any questions and respond to any questions asked using the question box function located in the GoToWebinar control. Uh, we'll be holded, holding a dedicated Q&A period at the end of this webinar, but you're welcome to enter any questions into the question box at any time during the presentation. Uh, we will be uh, sending the uh, report discussed in today's pres uh, presentation afterwards um, in an email to all registrants. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will also be shared on the Prosper Canada website and emailed to all registrants in the next few days. Uh, please feel free to share this with any friends or colleagues who may benefit from the information that was shared in this presentation. Uh, in the spirit of, of truth and reconciliation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the first people, the original people of this land who have been here since time immemorial. I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities and their ancestors who fulfilled their responsibilities to these lands, waters, plant life, and animal life so that we could all be here today. I'd also like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, Iroquois Confederacy, Confederacy, and the Wendat peoples, um, and that this territory is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I do not want to falsely suggest that I have profound knowledge of the dynamic migration and relationships among all in, uh, Indigenous nations and communities of this territory, as well as the treaties, covenants, and wampum belts of this land, but I view continuing to learn about these living agreements as part of my responsibility towards advancing reconciliation. I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone on the line joining us from traditional territories across Turtle Island. We're honored to be having this discussion with you today and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. This uh, webinar is hosted by Prosper Canada. Um, we were founded in 1986 and uh, are a national charity dedicated to expanding economic opportunity for Canadians living in poverty through program and policy innovation. As Canada's leading champion of financial empowerment, we work with governments, businesses, and groups to develop and promote financial policies, programs, and resources that transform lives and foster the prosperity of all Canadians. So just a bit of an agenda for today. Uh, after this, this welcome and introduction, we will be hearing from Eloise Duncan from the Financial Resilience Institute uh, to share with us an overview of um, the study Financial Vulnerability of Low-Income Canadians, a Rising Tide. We'd like to thank cooperators whose generous contribution made possible the research with the Financial Resilience Institute. Afterwards, uh, we will have a panel discussion um, on how the increasing financial vulnerability of Canadians is playing out in community and how policymakers should respond. And then we'll have a Q&A uh, from um, the questions that you all send in. So uh, joining me today uh, are Eloise Duncan. Eloise is the founder and CEO of the Financial Resilience Institute and is known as one of Canada's leading experts in financial health. She's a high energy social entrepreneur and a certified management consultant with over 25 years of experience in financial services, strategic consulting and financial health research, strategy and impact measurement. Eloise was also the previous founder and CEO of Seymour Management Consulting, Inc., established in 2009 and the creator of the Seymour Financial Resilience Index. Also joining me is Louise simba uh, She is co-director of Seed Winnipeg, a not-for-profit organization that works in partnership with over 100 organizations in Manitoba to deliver customized financial empowerment programs. Louise is a founding member and co-chair of the, of the Manitoba Financial Empowerment Network and a founding member of the National Asset Building Learning Exchange and currently serves on its steering committee. A former refugee, Louise is passionate about human rights and social justice. 
Louise has a Bachelor in Commerce from the University of Saskatchewan and a Master's in Comparative Social Research from Oxford University. So uh, all that being said, uh, Shermaine, if you could pass the presenter rights over to Eloise. Uh, Eloise, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're uh, on mute. There we go. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Sorry about that. So Eloise Duncan, CEO and founder of Financial Resilience Institute. Thrilled to be here today. So I'm just going to start my presentation with a short lived experience. Uh, so John, John is a really good friend of mine with a different name. He's in his 60s, a handyman who lives in Langley, about an hour outside Vancouver. He's single and a low income earner. A loner, he's a really kind man who rarely talks about his life or his financial situation. He's also ill with a disease. So in his own words, John would love to be able to just focus on his health, but he can't because of money worries. In the past month, he's had to move house um, from the basement suite he was living in because noise was seriously impacting his mental health for many years there. So it look, after looking at over 50 apartments, he has just managed to move into an apartment which is the same size as the old one, but now double the rent. So he's now paying $1,475 a month plus heat every month. He's losing sleep over money, doesn't know how he's going to pay the rent, but as he told me, he had no choice. He's been working less and less um, because of his illness and is now drawing on his small savings, which he's told me is not going to, they're not going to last for ever. On a list for senior social housing, he's been told that's going to take many years. He's definitely not able to get or, food, uh, get or afford the food he needs and gas, it, the gas prices are a real problem for him. He's really doing his best to manage through financially, but is certainly more financially vulnerable than he was a year ago, as well as significantly more financially stressed. So just a little bit about the Financial Resilience Institute. Uh, we're a partner of Prosper Canada and a not-for-profit organization that's striving to help improve the financial resilience and well-being of all Canadians by reducing financial vulnerability, in particular for those who, are mo who need help most or are most underserved, being a positive uh, catalyst for change through knowledge mobilization, specifically in the financial health and resilience aspect, and through fostering financial health, inclusion and empowerment. So this report was very kindly commissioned by Financial Resilience by Prosper Canada and is the second study uh, building on our detailed study last year. So how do we define households with low incomes? They are households with a household income under 25,000 plus households with more than an individual that have a household income between 25,000 and 50,000. Uh, our study is drawn from a very robust sample from the June 2022 Financial Wellbeing Study, which is a longitudinal study which we've been uh, conducting across Canada since 2017. So the sample size is just over 5,000 adult Canadians who are joint or primary uh, financial decision makers with a booth sample of just over 1,500 uh, low-income Canadians. We had a similar boost in the study last year, as well as in 2018, which has given us really great longitudinal data to work with. So our survey respondents were sort of half and half male, female, um, a good mix of boomers, Gen X and millennials, 63% were renters, and then we had a, a, a relatively good cross-section of people that were also facing barriers, um, such as uh, because they were um, not working owing to disabilities, et cetera. 
So just in terms of our tracking, uh, we have the CMAR Financial Resilience Index, which I'll speak to in a very high level way. And that um, is an instrument which combines with the longitudinal financial wellbeing study. So uh, we were able to ask specific questions uh, related to low incomes for that, low income Canadians for that. So here's the index indicators. Um, essentially, people uh, there there are nine behavioral resilience and sentiment and indicators which measure a person's uh, financial resilience, defined as their ability to get through financial hardships, stresses, and shocks as a result of unplanned life events. And so households are scored from zero to 100 based on their financial resilience score, where extremely vulnerable um, households have a score of zero to 30, and financially resilient households have a score of 70.01 to 100. So just a little bit of context on what we're seeing at the national level. Uh, we have seen a dip in the mean Canada financial resilience score of five by five points um, from 55.67 to 50.52 um, as of June 2022. So what we've seen now is that essentially we have just about 78% of the population mainstream are now not financially resi resilient, representing just over 20 million households. Um, and so that 73% is for the three segments that we define as extremely vulnerable, financially vulnerable, and approaching resilience. Very importantly, people are, are uh, represented ac across all household income demographics, across all four segments. So you can earn 100,000 and be extremely vulnerable. Similarly, uh, you can earn uh, a lot less than that and actually be financially resilient. What we have seen and we continue to see is that extremely vulnerable and financially vulnerable in particular are working extremely hard to uh, manage through, uh, for example, by significantly reducing their es essential expenses. And based on a lot of data that we have, uh, we see that there are significant nuances between household populations and across the four financial resilience segments for Canadians. Unfortunately, at the national level, 40% of households have a zero or negative savings rate at the moment, which is um, quite surprising. And that is 66% for low income households. We also see um, a, a growing sort of financial hardship gra um, gap, which we saw during the pandemic through the index when we were tracking things uh, three times a year. Unfortunately, in the post pandemic inflationary environment, we're continuing to see that gap. So what you can see from this data is that, for example, as of June 2022, 88% of uh, Canadians who are extremely vulnerable report that their household is experiencing significant financial hardship compared to 80% last year. And those numbers are very, very different compared to financially resilient households. I'm sharing this because many low-income Canadians are represented uh, within those more vulnerable populations. We have been tracking uh, the extent to which uh, money worries, financial stress has been impacting different well-being dimensions of Canadians right since 2017. And the numbers are stark and unfortunately, um, uh, unfortunately uh, financial stress is now impacting the physical health of 50% of Canadians, so one in two, and the mental health of 70% 70, 70 of Canadians. And what we see is when we score this against the index, Unfortunately, um, people from more extremely vulnerable and financially vulnerable households score lower across all well-being elements, from financial well-being all the way through to feeling connected to their community. Um, through the Institute, we're also conducting longitudinal analysis. So what that means is we're tracking the same sort of 1,500 people within the overall sample of 5,000 people um, that answered the index studies, uh, for example, last year compared to this year. And this work is important because what it does is it highlights mobility within the index, i.e. people can move up a segment by changing their behaviors and through other aspects. Similarly, they can slip back a segment, just like John, who I described um, in my lived experience story. Um, and there are different factors why people can slip back a segment. Uh, we're doing analysis on that from a behavioral perspective right now through the Institute, and we'll be sharing uh, insights with you um, over the coming weeks. So just a few summary highlights for low-income Canadians. 
so what we see is uh, just over half, a quarter of the population are actually low income now, um, representing 6.4 million households. So it's quite a significant portion of the population, a slight decrease from last year, but still uh, a significant portion. And unfortunately, the index is highlighting that there has been a serious uptick in the proportion of extremely vulnerable Canadians from 30, just under 34% of Canadians to 41% being extremely vulnerable within uh, lower income families as of June 2022. So we now see that 73% of, of low income Canadians, uh, which is about just under 4.7 4 million people, are now extremely vulnerable or financially vulnerable, uh, which is significantly more than what we're seeing at the national level. We're also seeing uh, the data for the two sub-segments, so households with under 25,000 versus those um, with more than one person that have 25 to 49,000 of household income. And as you can see, um, the numbers are going the wrong way there as well for the past year. So one of the things we do through the Institute is measure the uh, mean financial resilience score, not only for Canadians nationally, but for different segments, um, uh, including uh, many, many different ones, which we'll be releasing over, over the coming weeks. Um, for low-income Canadians, what we see is that the mean financial resilience score of, of these people have, has decreased to 37.20, which is, again, quite a significant decrease from last year, and really back to the pre-pandemic baseline levels of 37.07 in February 2020. So some of the um, some of the support that was provided by government um, that has helped that helped to uh, bolster the financial resilience of low-income Canadians, with them also working hard from a behavioural perspective um, to bridge through during the pandemic. Uh, now that that support has been uh, sort of um, stopped for many many households, obviously we're seeing increased financial vulnerability. We look at many different stressors and uh, debt stressors and other impacts for uh, Canadians and lower income Canadians. This is just a little bit of a sample, um, but what we see is that um, really a huge portion of people, so 68% of households, are facing barriers impacting their ability to earn money, and just under 65% are, are, are um, facing significant financial hardship. A quarter of low-income households were also spending more, um, more than their income in June 2022. We saw an increase in this at the national level as well, um, but the, the numbers are, um, again, sort of quite stark for us, and we do see that uh, this is obviously being impacted by the cost of living crisis and the increase in, um, in the cost of food and essentials, which is really putting a toll on many, many families. So now, unfortunately, 46% of households have a liquid savings buffer of three weeks or less, which again is, uh, is really, really not good. Um, this compares to 28% for Canadians at the national level. Um, so quite a significant increase over the past year for lower income Canadians. And nearly one in three households now are not able to get or food or afford the food they need, which is something that is um, very concerning. Obviously, food insecurity is is being measured through other studies, um, but these these numbers are 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 um, very stark. When we look at impacts of financial stress on the well-being of lower income Canadians, again, uh, we see that uh, nearly 80% of them, people like John in the live story, um, confirm that financial stress is impacting their mental health. Um, it's impacting the physical health of nearly 65% of lower income families. Um, it's impacting the productivity or performance of, at work of, of these people, which is a real problem for employers and, and very much causing isolation as well. So we track many different access, access to financial help indicators through the Institute. And uh, what we see here is that 12.5% of lower income Canadians have experienced difficulties in accessing financial help programs over the past 12 months. So again, quite higher, higher numbers than what we see for Canadians at the national level. 9.4% of lower income Canadians were not able to access tax filing help or support to receive government benefits they're entitled 
to, um, indicating again the huge value of the wonderful tax filing help and other resources being provided by organizations like Prosper Canada. And another, uh, just under 9% of people could not access help with managing, managing their debt. So one of the things we're able to do through the index is sort of look at the impact of access and other aspects or interventions on the financial resilience uh, score and, and uh, financial resilience um, of, of Canadians and, and, and different populations. And this data is exploratory only um, because we have not done analysis on the sociodemographic uh, differences between low-income Canadians who did and didn't access these supports. That said, um, this analysis does indicate um, the, the, the value of the financial services support being provided by nonprofits, financial services um, sectors in the ecosystem. Because what we see is that lower income Canadians who were able to access financial help or programs or services have a significantly higher mean financial resilience score compared to those who were not able to access financial help. So financial resilience score 39.06 compared to 24.12 uh, based on this indicator for June 2022. Similarly, uh, we see similar um, data for uh, households that were able to access help with managing their debt and or with filing their taxes. Uh, so again, improvements there, which is, uh, which is really good to see. Uh, through the Institute, we're also tracking, obviously, financial vulnerability by province uh, as well. So we just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot here um, that, you know, in, in Ontario, as an example, more Ontarian low-income Canadians are experiencing financial hardship and housing affordability issues uh, compared to low-income Canadians overall. So we see that... Um, you know, 67% of them are facing significant hardship compared to 65% of low-income Canadians. So this really um, emphasizes the criticality of, um, of nonprofits and other organizations supporting uh, these, these families within their provinces, knowing that there may be differences by, by province. And again, we can see the slight difference data um, here for Ontario and low-income Canadians. So 13.6% uh, of Ontario lower, lower income families were not able to access financial help programs or services, for example. So thank you so much for the opportunity of sharing these highlights. There's more data um, on in the report itself. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we have time for um, the important dialogue and Q&A. If anyone would like a copy of this re report, they're very welcome to email me after this after this um, session. And again, a huge thank you to uh, Prosper Canada and also to cooperators for enabling this work to happen. Thank you so much, Eloise. Um, I will now uh, ask Eloise and Louise to uh, put their cameras on. And while they're doing that, just a reminder that uh, you can put any questions you have while we're uh, speaking um, into the... So, um, hi, Louise. And while we're waiting uh, for Eloise to put her camera on, as somebody who works for a community organization serving people living on lower incomes, can you react to what you've just heard from Eloise and how have you seen these kind of trends play out in your community? Yeah, no, that uh, presentation certainly resonated and also validated a lot of what we're seeing in the community. Um, our programs have always been oversubscribed, so that's tax filing, financial literacy, uh, asset building programs, uh, access to ID, um, access to basic banking. Um, but had a meeting um, with our manager several weeks ago and uh, shared that particularly in terms of tax filing and benefits navigation and access to identification, um, that we have never seen such a big gap between our capacity to provide services and uh, the demand. Uh, so uh, we open up our appointment slots every Monday at nine o'clock. 
uh, this week at 9.30, I uh, got an email from the team saying all the spots were full. In the previous week, that email came out at 9.31. The week before that, the email came out at 9.40. So that means that from 9.30 on, uh, starting on Monday all the way to Friday, we spent the rest of the time telling people that we couldn't serve them, turning them away and asking them to phone again at nine o'clock the following Monday. Wow, that's that's really concerning. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more and then Eloise, I'll ask you the same question afterwards about how you've seen COVID and the ensuing inflationary period affect people living on, on low and, and moderate incomes? Yeah, I could talk about this for hours, but I'll keep it brief. Um, I, in one word, it's been devastating. <laughs> um, there was a brief reprieve, uh, which I think um, was demonstrated in the data that the SERB payments and the supports that came into play uh, really helped, uh, but now they're gone. Um, and people, and on top of that, uh, people are also dealing with the impact of overpayments and what that's done to their other benefits and entitlements. And so helping people navigate all of that has been uh, really important and difficult work. Uh, but we've seen people thrown into homelessness because of that. Uh, families are barely making ends meet. Uh, they're being pushed to the brink. And we now have a crisis in homelessness in Winnipeg. And I'm sure it's being reflected in other cities as well. Thanks, Louise. Um, Eloise, can you maybe talk a little bit more about what you know what you've seen in the in the data about about the impact of the pandemic and the the period of high inflation? Yeah, thanks so much, Sasha. So, I mean, I think I shared some of the highlights. We're tracking things across many different indicators, but um, as as you see, the the data tells a very clear story that there is an increase in in lower income Canadians that are experiencing significant financial hardship. We're seeing serious impacts on their on their diff, on their well being. Um, we're seeing an increase in proportion of people that cannot get or food or afford the food they need. Um, challenges from a behavioral perspective in terms of more of these populations having to resort to more predatory financial services such as installment loans and payday loans, et cetera. Um, and just uh, increases in, in job insecurity and also financial, um, financial security, housing security, uh, etc. So the all the numbers unfortunately are going the wrong way and um, there's there's no question that people are doing their very best to, to bridge through but um, they're having to make very very difficult trade-off decisions and uh, and and more and more of these people are facing barriers than you know than, than they were before. Yeah, uh, it's it's really concerning, and I'm wondering. Um, I'll, I'll ask you both this question, but maybe Eloise will start with you from a kind of data perspective. Um, who's being disproportionately affected by by these trends in, in increasing financial vulnerability? So, I mean, I think this is it's a that's a, a very big and a multi-layered question. It's a great question, and. I, 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 I think one of the things that we're doing at the Institute is also looking at different populations and how those overlay. So, for example, we know that um, more Canadians, uh, for example, that are lower income are re also represented um, as being, for example, single parent families or not being able to work um, owing to a disability. Um, they're, they're more likely to have um, income or expense volatility. Um, but we're, we're really seeing that the most financially vulnerable populations are being the most impacted by the, the inflation environment. So, um, we'll be we'll be releasing some more data on this over the couple, next couple of weeks. But you know, Canadians with a disability have one of the lowest mean financial resilience scores of all populations. So that's they have a score of twenty nine point seven nine as of June. So that's you know compared to uh, compared to the thirty nine point six for low income Canadians. So if you're low income and you're also you also have a disability, you're much more likely to have um, a much lower mean financial resilience score and to have been more impacted by the pandemic. Um, similarly, people that um, have poor or fair credit scores and are challenged from a debt perspective and or impact 
impacted by rising interest rates are really, really financially vulnerable right now. Um, and, and then we see, again, this sort of crosses all segments, but people like uh, my friend John, um, who have been impacted by negative, by, by life events, uh, such as reduced work, or having to move home because of a, a non-controllable issue. Again, those those Canadians um, across the spectrum, but particularly low-income Canadians, are very, very challenged. Thanks, Louise. Uh, Louise, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Who are you seeing most disproportionately affected? Yeah, well, coincidentally, I uh, just had a Manitoba Financial Empowerment Network meet meeting just prior to this and one of the questions that we posed to the group was who are you most concerned about in our community from a financial wellness perspective um, and it definitely um, I, I'll echo what Eloise said um, it, it definitely is consistent with the groups that are at disproportionate risk of living in poverty so people with disabilities recent immigrants older single adults indigenous peoples uh, one group that was highlighted which surprised me a bit and and i agree with this is uh, low wage earners um, increasing concern about that uh, particular group and i also really appreciate uh, eloise's um, highlighting uh, intersectionality and how that puts people at double, triple jeopardy um, if you have a disability and you're Indigenous. And so we also see that uh, because it just layers on barrier upon barrier upon barrier and makes it really, really challenging for folks. Uh, in terms of the homelessness crisis, um, it's disproportionately impacting the Indigenous community. Uh, just completed a street census uh, for this year. Uh, a group of agencies in Winnipeg did that. Revealed that 70% uh, of, uh, of, of the people that were surveyed were Indigenous. Nine in 10, um, nearly nine in 10, 89% of the people who slept outdoors in abandoned buildings, tents, vehicles, encampments, or other public locations were Indigenous. And we have people that are literally living in the backyard of seed in the abandoned building next door um, in cars. Uh, so it's, it's all around us uh, in terms of uh, the work that we're doing. Thank you, Louise. The one other thing, so I completely agree with everything you say, just based on the data that we see. The other thing I just, I, I, I miss saying it when we were talking about the intersectionality is women, you know, women and single parents. And we've been tracking the financial resilience gender gap for many, many years through the Institute, something we're really, um, really passionate about. And, um, you know, if you are a woman who is a single parent who also has a, um, is not able to work owing to a disability or is caring for others, um, you know, you're going to be more, more challenged. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eloise and, and Louise. Um, Eloise, you've kind of, you know, painted a very dire picture, but if we look at the 2020 poverty data from the federal government, which is the, the latest year that we have, it, it paints a much rosier picture. Can you kind of try to square that, that circle for us? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, why, why, why I created the index is because uh, we need to have different measures um, beyond asset, traditional, you know, GDP and um, asset and income measures for for Canadians to really see what's going on. And, and so, I mean, that's why we created the financial, the Seymour Financial Resilience Index to really measure financial vulnerability and financial resilience in different ways, and then link that to impacts on. Uh, on well-being, for example. So, I mean, uh, I am a firm believer that it's very critical for policymakers, financial institutions, and others to um, use this data and track um, track what's going on for more vulnerable populations from a longitudinal perspective to really shine a light on the the, the communities and the populations that need more targeted support uh, as a result of what's going on underneath the surface and and that and that underneath the surface or underneath their assets or their credit score is is essentially their financial vulnerability and their financial stress and their and their well-being 
Thanks, Louise. Um, Louise, I'll, I'll let you add on to that if you have anything to add, but I also wanted to ask you, you know, we're hearing from, from community organizations like SEED, and you spoke to this a bit at the beginning, um, that there's kind of an outside need for financial help services and that people are coming with more and more complex problems that take a lot more time to deal with. I'm wondering, you know, how is SEED dealing with this challenge and what's needed to better support this work in communities? Yeah, so I'd say cross-sectoral partnerships and partnerships with other community uh, organizations has been really important um, and, and helpful because uh, along with that comes uh, an infusion of all sorts of in-kind support, um, which is helpful. Uh, but we've also had to make really tough decisions about the best use of resources. Um, so are we allocating resources internally to areas of highest demand so taking money out of say our match savings program area and putting it towards tax filing because that's where the gap between um, our service delivery capacity and the demand is the greatest and where we see the greatest level of desperation um, we have also um, we are dealing with more complex cases but we're also making really difficult decisions about scaling back the depth of service delivery uh, so that we can serve more people. So we're turning fewer people away, uh, and that's really, really challenging uh, for staff, uh, many of whom have that experience of living on a low income. Um, we're also trying to find funding to expand provision uh, of services to meet the demand, but all of the new funding sources are time limited and project based, so that's very unstable. And so I'd say as a consequence, I think it'd be really interesting to apply a similar lens to organizations. And I'd say that the sector, and this also came out at our Manitoba Financial Empowerment Network meeting uh, that we just had, uh, the community-based organizations are now, I think, less resilient than they have been. Um, there was an infusion of funding related to CERB from foundations, from various levels of government. That's gone, but the need is still there and perhaps arguably even greater. And so we're trying to do more with less. Uh, staff are also <laughs> being impacted by COVID. And so there's always a disproportionately high proportion of staff that are off work and so that's leading to stress, burnout, and staff are also dealing with inflationary pressures. Our sector is chronically underpaid when compared to sort of comparable work that's being done within government or other institutions. Um, and so one of uh, the, um, one of our community partners said, how can we be asking our staff to support others when they're also struggling personally? Um, and so that's that's really, really challenging. So uh, there's an urgent need for more resources to provide more financial stability to those organizations and also to improve the quality of those jobs. Thanks, Louise, um, and appreciate, you know, hearing, hearing, you know, not only the impact on the people who are coming to you um, to, to benefit from your services, but also on, on the staff. Um, Eloise, you, you talked a little bit about this, but can you talk a little bit more about what the data highlight around the efficacy and availability of financial help services for people on low income? Yes, I mean, I think at the highest level, you know, the numbers don't look too bad, um, you know, but when you when you look at under the hood, at what's going on for lower income Canadians and those who are um, extremely vulnerable with a with a financial resilience score of zero to 30, for example, the access challenges across many different types of financial help um, sort of aspects that help with tax filing help to um, access to help uh, in terms of re relevant products and solutions to support these people um, are, are, are the numbers are worse across the board. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it's really, really important to be measuring access for these populations and 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 looking at when you know when when the when the numbers, as, as Louise has said, the demand is is much higher, and there there are access challenges for these for these populations, which need to be um, filled by. You know, from my perspective, not just from the um, from the not -profit, not for profit sector, but they need to be filled by financial institutions and other organisations that have a role in supporting these people. 
Thanks, Eloise. Um, I mentioned that uh, that this work was made possible by by a generous contribution from cooperators, and they have been funding us to look at uh, the gap in uh, affordable, trustworthy, and appropriate uh, financial help services for people on low incomes. And we're finding that really there is a huge gap that these services aren't available. Um, in a lot of places, and that where they are available, as you say, Louise, they're really underfunded and there isn't the capacity. So we've been advocating for sustained uh, government support for community financial help services and, and also for their integration into other government services um, that are accessed by people on low incomes. We're also kind of working with the federal government to help ensure that people are accessing the benefits for which they're eligible. Louise, can you comment on these and, and other kinds of policies that we need to see from all levels of government to kind of turn the tide on these trends and better support people who are living on, on low incomes? Yeah, so huge shout out to Prosper. I can't tell you how much we appreciate uh, the work that you're doing on the funding front and um, SEED and our partner organizations have been a direct beneficiary of those efforts uh, and it is making a difference um, in the lives of, of people here in Manitoba. Um, so I think in addition to that urgent need for sustained core funding, um, I would say that uh, it would also be beneficial because a lot of our work is around benefits navigation. Um, so to also be working towards systems change to reduce the barriers and make it easier for individuals to access benefits. So auto enrollment um, uh, options are really helpful, plain language, like all of those, those pieces and really engaging with community around what, what the barriers are and what that needs to look like. Uh, the other thing that I would also say is um, the pandemic accelerated a process that was already underway uh, in a lot of government uh, agencies, uh, which was to um, shift to more virtual phone, like online service delivery, and to either completely eliminate or severely restrict in-person access, mm -hmm. which disproportionately negatively impacts the most financially vulnerable. Like we're all aware of the digital divide and what those implications are. And so uh, I think it's really critical for CRA, Service Canada, social assistance offices to reintroduce or expand in-person access because essentially part of what's happening is work that previously used to be done by government is essentially being offloaded onto community organizations. Um, and so I, I can't stress that point enough. I feel like I'm shouting at the wind most of the time, <laughs> but, but I think, I think it, is, it is really, really critical if we really want to make sure that these programs, these income supports are available to the people in Canada that most need them. Thanks, Louise. Um, so uh, that is the, the end of my prepared questions. So uh, we've got some questions from the audience and um, please continue to, to send them in. Um, the first question is for Eloise. Has the Seymour Resilience Financial Index been peer reviewed? That is, how has it been vetted to determine its descriptive usefulness? And do you have any links for, for articles? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So yes and yes. So um, the Seymour Financial Resilience Index builds on over six years of longitudinal financial wellbeing studies data for Canada. So it's a very, very, uh, it builds on a tremendous amount of data for Canada. Um, the index has been peer reviewed by Statistics Canada. And last year, we launched a joint report with Statistics Canada on the financial resilience and financial well-being of, of Canadians during the COVID-19 pandemic, compare, comparing the index data to actual um, transactional administrative data um, held by Statistics Canada. So it's been peer-reviewed by Statistics Canada. It's also been peer-reviewed by the C.D. Howe Institute, um, Canada's leading think tank. And we have published um, intelligence memos via them through the index as 
well. Um, it's also been peer reviewed by leading organizations such as Van City, uh, who's our core funder for the Institute um, that's using the index and other organizations. And then lastly, it's been peer reviewed um, more informally on a global basis through the UNPRB, which is a group of 28 banks and credit unions around the world um, facilitated by the UN um, uh, that are all committed to financial health and inclusion, uh, impact measurement and innovation across the world. So um, the Institute's indicators and index have been um, thrown into the mix of um, many, many, inter many, many indicators and been uh, peer reviewed and sort of risen to the top as core indicators um, on a global basis as well. Oh, so Thanks, I'll ask your question on reports. Um, if you go to our website, which is um, www.finresilienceinstitute.org, uh, and then you go to the reports section, uh, there's a ton of reports in there from uh, 2017 to date. Um, and so I just shared just a couple of the highlights from the June 2022 report, uh, but. Um, there, that one and others are available there for free for everyone. Thanks, Eloise. And as I mentioned before, we will be sending out the link to the report to uh, all webinar registrants after the, the webinar. Um, the next two questions are kind of similar, so I'll ask them both and would love to hear from both of you. Um, what are the reasons why participants couldn't access help and the similar one is, you know, what was the barrier to entry for consumers not receiving help for debt or financial help? Uh, so maybe, you know, uh, we'll start with Eloise and then, and then Louise, um, you can add on. Yeah, sorry, can you just reframe the question? I just want to make sure I can answer it based on the data that we have. I think essentially it's like, why, why are people not able to access financial health services? Yeah. Is, so is that I, something that you looked at? I mean, maybe it's just you asked, could they? Yeah, so, Did you so ask why? It, it, it's a it's a great question. I think we would need to do from a data analytics perspective. We can we can go deeper on that. Um, but I think there, you know, it's a lot of the different reasons that we've already discussed in terms of um, in terms of these households facing more barriers from a number of different perspectives. Um, but Louise, maybe you want to answer that maybe based on what you're seeing at the front line. So I would say one of the biggest barriers is just the availability of um, neutral, trusted uh, sources of financial help that essentially have the best interest of the participant in mind. Um, so, so that would be one barrier. But then when you, again, take that sort of intersectional lens and think about particular populations and the barriers that they face, um, obviously, uh, in-person services are still something that is really challenging and for a really high proportion of the population that SEED serves and our partner organizations, they don't have um, regular access to phones, internet, email, and so um, uh, they need to be able to access the services in person and since the pandemic hit, uh, there's been fewer of those kinds of services available even through community organizations. Uh, and then uh, when you look at specific populations uh, like recent immigrants to Canada, then you have language barriers, which is where our partnerships come in and being able to deliver and provide services in first languages. Um, similar issues with the kinds of accommodations that are required for people with disability. And so again, we work with disability serving organizations, but often you have uh, uh, one staff person within that organization that's responsible and it's like either something that they're doing off the side of their desk or they're funded at sort of 10 hours a week to do that and again the demand far outstrips their capacity to be able to deliver those services so there's just some of the reasons why uh, why it is it is challenging thanks thanks louise um the next question I, I can take a first stab at answering um and then i will pass it on to both of you the question is is there work or studies happening to look at systemic barriers to claiming government benefits uh so i um can direct you to the prosper canada uh uh, <laughs> website for a lot of the kind of work that we've done looking at specific populations um who are kind of you know 
not not getting their their benefits uh, or who have larger barriers. Um, you know, uh, recently we've looked at people with disabilities, but we've also kind of uh, done work looking at the barriers uh, to, to other um, populations like like newcomers. Um, and you know, also recently the the Auditor General released a report. Um, basically saying the federal government needs to work harder to uh, reach um, hard to reach populations in terms of access to benefits. And so that's something that uh, we're hearing a lot. We're hearing a lot uh, in conversations with government. This is becoming a, a um, real focus uh, and they're, you know, they are working to try to figure this out. But, um, you know, I think also are cognizant of the need to kind of um, garner the, the kind of expertise of, of community organizations. So uh, Louise, Eloise, I don't know if you have anything to add, any any kind of work that you have seen or that you've been involved with. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what you've said, uh, that there is a high degree of receptivity within uh, government systems. And so they're actively engaged. Uh, so we have representatives from all three levels of government that are part of the Manitoba Financial Empowerment Network. Um, and so that, takes many forms uh, in terms of um, addressing uh, those systemic barriers. So we had a suggestion from the Canada Revenue Agency to do something that had been done in other jurisdictions, which was to organize a service delivery expo, one location, one day people that are experiencing homelessness can access a whole range of services. So everything from medical care to getting their taxes filed to accessing housing, to getting ID, uh, and so we brought together uh, over 30 different service providers, and I think the last expo we served over a thousand people, so that's one example of a type of intervention, but then there's interventions within those systems, and so you might think it's odd that I mentioned ID as a financial help service, but part of what we've recognized is basic identification is a prerequisite to being able to then create that financial stability, and so we have to start there. And so we're currently in the process of working with vital statistics and employment and income assistance and then homelessness Winnipeg to establish an access to ID network and uh, vital stats, for example, is really, really interested in hearing from community organizations that are helping people navigate those systems. What can we do better? How can we provide better services? Uh, we're going to be exploring uh, an ID storage solution, uh, for example, specifically to meet and address the, the needs of people that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we're also going to be trying to work with the justice system so that people before they exit the justice system have the ID that they need and they're not part of that long queue on Monday and having to come in week after week after week to try and get something as basic as ID so that they can have a fresh start. So those are just a few examples. I could go on and on, but that work is active. It's happening. Uh, community organizations are engaged. They're willing to take the time to be part of things like our Financial Empowerment Policy Committee and engage with government. And we're also getting receptivity on the side of government as well. Wow, that's Thanks, fantastic. Louise. Fantastic. I don't have anything to add, but I mean, that's wonderful. Uh, well, Eloise, I do have a question for you, um, which is, uh, somebody's asking about the different demographics that you looked at when collecting yeah. data. So um, you mentioned, you know, for example, looking at the the gender gap. But what what were the different demographics that you that you looked at? Yeah, great question. So within the national, so so within the national study, we capture a lot of demographic data. Um, such, you know, so obviously the the obvious ones are, you know, age, household income, um, province, um, ethnicity, uh, whether people are renters versus homeowners, with or without a mortgage. Um, and yeah, and then and then we look at many other different attributes as well. So um, whether people are, um, you know, reporting using specific um, products or services that may be more predatory, etc. So there's a lot of a lot of rich demographic and then financial uh, behavioral data that that's captured by the institute. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if anyone's got any questions more about uh, the, the low income Canadians, but we're able to slice and dice the data many, many different ways based on the financial well-being study, which is um, just it, it's like a 15 to 
18 minute online study. So a huge number of questions are in there, which are smashed against the index. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's probably important to note just for going forward is we are all, always able to add new or customized questions to the financial wellbeing study and then smash it against the index for organizations that work with us. So there is the ability to go much deeper around a specific population or an access challenge, um, but sort of build in uh, the, the, the benchmark data against the index and, and the longitudinal, if that makes sense. Thanks, Eloise. Um, the next question I think is is for you, but I, I'm also interested in, in um, your perspective, Louise. So they're kind of referencing the slide showing how uh, people benefit from access to tax filing and benefits navigation help, and wondering if there are other markers in this research for what's helping to move Canadians into the financial resilience categories. So and I think, you know, the work that we've done so far, the analytics we've done so far is exploratory. There's absolutely the ability to do deeper dive um, analytics and correlation analysis, et cetera, through the data that we've got on low income Canadians. Um, but I, I think there is also an opportunity and a need to combine the quant data that we've got with qualitative insights as well that, that gets to some of the um, intersected um, aspects of this for Canadians. I don't know if you agree with that, Louise. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I would uh, respond in a couple of ways. Uh, so one is when it comes to tax filing, um, there's just the infusion, the potential infusion of significant amounts of money into the household from the tax refund, uh, from the Canada Child Benefit. Uh, and so a lot of um, benefits are connected to filing taxes. And so I think that helps in terms of uh, financial stability in a really practical and, and direct way. So we've literally had people who hadn't filed taxes for years and years and years who were homeless. Um, getting their taxes filed and being eligible for potentially thousands of dollars and so that's transformative like that means that someone can actually afford first and last month's rent uh, security deposit whatever they need to be able to transition to to uh, to housing um, and then in terms of some of the other financial help services uh, such as financial literacy and financial coaching so we've also done sort of pre-post around our financial literacy, and um, it's partly about the information, but I would say that it's also about things like, because a lot of times people already know what they need to do, it's almost like, like going on a diet, like you know what food is good for you, and so it's a question of being in a supported environment where you can actually do what you already know. Um, and also align what it is that you want to do with your longer term goals. And so we've measured things like statistically significant change and people's sense of hope, uh, their sense of confidence, also their willingness to get financial help from other sources. Uh, and so all of that and, and, and reduce stress levels. And so I think all of that, I think, would result in better financial resilience scores. And then qualitatively, and those are the like when I've sat in on focus groups, um, yeah, it's just really, really interesting the kind of impact um, that engagement in those programs has on, on individuals and uh, the ripple effects. And so part of what really strikes me is to have people's knowledge and confidence grow to the extent where they start sharing the information with other people in their low income households or their kids. Um, and or even their community center so we've had people take our money management training book to their <laughs> to their women's group and start like introducing it to their group and running through the the different activities and exercises and so and so for me um those kinds of accounts are really inspiring because i think what happens to people shift from being in this sort of survival day-to-day -day mode and just wondering how am i going to get out of this to actually having the cognitive space and the emotional support to be able to uh, have a line on sight uh, on what they need to do and to be able to start taking those steps so that sense of personal advocacy i think is huge 
Yeah, Louise, I completely agree with that. And I, I, I would echo that from, from our data, we are capturing many other indicators around, as you say, like confidence in my ability to make informed decisions, confidence in my ability to um, achieve my short-term savings goals, which are which is one of the index indicators. And then, and then also um, uh, indicators around, as you say, empowerment and just overall well-being and you're absolutely right the um there are so many sort of positive knock-on effects for people that um don't just learn about these products and services or build their financial literacy but but get help with changing and adjusting their money habits as appropriate and accessing the right supports and services to help them move forward in tangible ways um Thank you both. Uh, we're, we're at time. I just didn't want to cut you off because I loved what you were saying. Um, so I really want to thank you all for joining us and thank Louise and Eloise uh, for, for uh, your insights. Uh, very appreciate your joining us. Um, as we mentioned, uh, the resources uh, shared today will be emailed to you. Um, so we'll be sending an email soon and the recorded webinar will be posted on our learning hub, which you can access at this link. There's also uh, the reports that I was talking about around barriers to access to benefits. And uh, if you want to contact any of us, here is our contact info. Uh, again, thank you so much, Eloise and Louise, for joining us. We really appreciate um, you know, benefiting from your, your expertise today. So thanks everyone. Very much.